Today I work in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Madras. Um, my area of specialization, the area of research is computer architecture and organization. And so I will be handling 15 lectures in the, in the topic computer organization as a part of this initiative. Uh, I hope all of you uh, can hear me. If you cannot hear me, please uh, raise your hand so that we will try and fix it. If I do not see your hands or you come on chat, if I do not see a chat or your hand raise, then I assume that I am audible. Uh, we will just do another small visual test. I am requesting the camera to focus on this. <coughs> I hope all of you can see 1 A B C. <coughs> if you are not able to see 1 A B C, please raise your hand. Right. <coughs> okay. So I assume that I am both audible and my writing on the board is also visible to you. So let us start. So let me also basically tell you what is the objective of this course. We are not going to teach what is there in the book because that you can learn. What we will do is to create some foundation material and teach you those foundation material which will help you in understanding the topic namely computer organization. So in the next 15 lectures, I will be covering certain things which you may or may not see in your reference books. But what I believe that it is very important for you to understand to handle this subject with confidence. This is the objective of the next 15 lectures. Now, <coughs> there are three important subjects that any computer science and engineering student should be thorough with. If you take your degree, the, na the name of your degree, it is computer science and engineering. So, the engineering aspect of your degree essentially has three important subjects. One is computer organization, another is operating systems, another is compilers. So these three are considered to be the foundation subjects for the engineering uh, term in your computer science and engineering degree. So it is very important that you take special care you give un undivided attention to this subject and learn it in its full glory. Okay. So let me, this effort, why we selected computer organization and architecture of out of several other courses or of other 50 courses that exist in any computer science and engineering curriculum, why is computer organization selected is for the same reason. So I request every student in their own interest take this seriously, do a great job, understand this understanding will take you a very, very long way uh, in your career. All the best. Now, uh, I will also be sharing five tutorials, approximately one for every three classes and I expect you to solve these tutorials. At the end of it, the solutions will also be discussed and you can basically look at the solutions and validate your understanding. <coughs> Another thing that I also want to uh, tell you here is that 
I want to give you a gist of how we teach at IIT, right. We teach the concepts in the class, but the examination or the assignments or the tutorials will not basically ask the concepts again. It will, there are, there will be problems which will use the concepts that are taught in the class. So, you have to understand what we teach here and when you want to solve those problems, you will, it will not be solved in the class, just understanding what we teach here will not immediately give you answers to those problems. Basically, you have to think based on what we teach here, apply the things that we have taught here, apply the concepts and then uh, you know take it to the uh, problems and then solve those problems, right. So, there is a basic difference between you just answering the questions after looking at the class and probably understanding it and that you understand and start using what we teach here to go and solve the problem. So, the tutorials are designed, many of the problems in the tutorials are designed in that fashion, right. So, this is totally what we try and we are attempting this time. Again, uh, the success of this program. <coughs> The success of this program will be, uh, will just not be that I deliver the lecture or the camera works properly or the network works properly. The success of this program is fully measured based on how you react to this. So, I want all the students to be on time, attend these classes, take notes, take notes not on loose sheet of papers but to have a real bound notebook, take the notes and also solve the tutorial problems and finally, come out with a clear good understanding of the subject, right. If that all these things happen at your end, then we will call this program a success, otherwise it would be a grand failure, okay. I hope I am conveying what I want out of you, right. So, Assuming that all of you are going to cooperate with us, with your own teachers and the QEEE team which has put a great effort to get this running and myself, I assume that you are going to give me all the cooperation, give all of us all the cooperation for your benefit and let us start on the course now. Okay. <coughs> If you look at traditional way by which people have been understanding computers, there are two basic components to this computer. One is the hardware, another is the software. Now, if you look at any computer science curriculum, there is a subject called computer organization. There is also a subject called computer architecture. One fundamental question that we would like to answer here is what is the difference between computer architecture and computer organization. Computer architecture teaches you how to design the hardware. Computer organization teaches you how to use that hardware. Basically, computer organization tells you that there are certain features in the hardware and this is the way you have to use this hardware. In other words, the computer organization teaches you something called A, B, I. A, B, I stands for application binary interface. <clears throat> now, in the next 15 lectures, we will be talking about this application binary interface. As we go on with these lectures, I will certain the whole scene of what I mean by this application binary interface, by this term application binary interface 
will become more and more clear to you as we proceed over these 15 lectures. At the first step, we would like to understand why computers work. What is that fundamental concept which makes computer manufacturing possible? The concept is that of a transistor. The concept is that of a transistor <coughs> and the ability of a transistor to distinguish between a 0 and a 1. What is 0 and what is 1? 0 corresponds to <coughs> something called a ground voltage. one corresponds to something called a supply voltage. <coughs> Zero <coughs> in olden days would be in the range between 0 to 0.7 volts, anywhere in this range, while a supply voltage can be as high as 5 volts. With the recent systems, which are very, very power <coughs> hungry in the sense, sorry, power conservative in the sense they consume very less power. For example, some of the computers, some of the processors inside your mobile phone, wherein it consumes very less amount of battery. If it is going to consume lot of power, then every half an hour you have to recharge your battery. So, this systems, today the ground voltage can be something between 0 to 0 0.3 volts and my supply voltage can be something like 1.7 volts. For example, it can be much lesser than this also. Now, on one end I am talking about zeros and ones, on another end I am talking about some real values of these voltages. This is called the lo logical level, while this is called the physical level. So, as far as computer science is and engineering is concerned, we will more concentrate on the logical level. While electrical engineering will teach you how to make transistors, how to reduce these power, how to make transistors that consume less power, these would be subject matter of electrical engineering. From the computer science and engineering point of view, we will talk about logical level. Now, the topic is that how does transistors which form the base, which are the basic components for making a yeah, hardware today distinguish between a logical 0 and a logical 1. There are two types of transistors that make a uh, hardware. One is called the PMOS transistor, another is the NMOS transistor. A transistor typically consists of three <coughs> terminals. I am now going to draw the PMOS transistor. The transistor has what we call as a source, it has something called 
a sink and it has something called a gate. There is a source, there is a sink and there is a gate. The way the P PMOS transistor works could be captured in this small table. Then this is for the PMOS transistor. When the gate is 0, the transistor is on. When the gate is 1, the transistor is off. What do you mean by on? On means the source is connected to the sink. Off means the source is disconnected from the sink. So, the PMOS transistor distinguishes between a logical 0 and a logical 1 by this table. When I apply a logical 0 at the gate, the source of the PMOS transistor is connected to the, connected to the sink of the PMOS transistor. When I apply a logical 1, the source gets disconnected from the sink. <coughs> so, the NMOS works exactly opposite to this. When I apply a 0, it is off and when I apply a 1, it is on. So, the ability of the transistor to distinguish between logical 0 and logical 1 makes it possible for us to do lot of computations using the computer. This is the fundamental concept based on which why computers exist today and they can do this type of functionality, right. Now, what we will do in the next step is that we will now use this functionality and realize some functions, right. We will use this capability of the transistors to distinguish between 0 and 1 and realize some functions. I am sure many of you would have undergone, would have sat through the digital logic subject, wherein you would have studied about AND gates, NOT gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, etc. Today, we will realize how a NOT functionality can be realized using these transistors. All of you know what a NOT gate is, should be knowing, but just for the sake of completeness, I will basically tell you what, how a NOT gate works. So, this is how we represent a NOT gate. This is the input, this is the output. When I apply a 0 in the input, the output will be 1. When I apply a 1 in the input, the output would be 0. Now, we would like to realize this functionality using the NMOS and the PMOS transistors. This is how we realize it.
if you look at this what i have done here is i have taken a p transistor this is the p transistor and i have taken another n transistor connected both their sync together so this is the source of the p transistor this is the source of the n transistor and this the, this point is the sink of this transistor and i have also connected their gates together so this is the gate of the p transistor and this is the gate of the n transistor i have i have connected the gates together and i apply the input to both the gates and i collect the output from that sinks right now what will happen if i apply a zero here when i apply a zero here if you had noted down my previous drawing table you will understand that if i apply a zero here this transistor is on while this transistor is off so what will happen is when i measure the voltage from output to ground since this is shorted i get the value 1 because this point and this point now becomes the same because this is connected well this is disconnected while well, this point and the this point now becomes the same so when i measure the voltage here what i am going to get i am going to get a 1 so when i apply a zero here this transistor is switched on while this is switched off so this point and the out point both becomes the same because this is now connected and so i am going to get a 1 here so when i apply a zero i am going to get a 1 similarly when i apply a one here what happens this gets disconnected while this gets connected so this point and this point becomes the same and when i measure the voltage here i am going to get a zero there again i rip uh, repeat when i apply a one here this gets disconnected while this gets connected and so this point out and this point becomes the same so when i measure the voltage i am going to get zero so when i apply a zero i get a one when i apply a one i get a zero and this is nothing but a not gate understand okay so <clears throat> now let us go and do a, a a little more complex gate so this not is basically a unary gate why it is a unary gate because it has one input and one of course one output but it has one input so this is called a unary gate the next that we will do is a binary gate which has two inputs
Now let us take this gate. <coughs> So, there are two inputs to this gate A B, the A is connected to this P transistor and also to this N transistor, B is connected to this P transistor and also to this N transistor and this is the output. So, I have put two P transistors in parallel and connected one here while I have put N two N transistors in series and I have connected 0 here. Now, let us see what is going to happen when we do when we apply different voltages to A and B. The four different combinations of voltages that I could apply to A and B are as follows 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 1. So, what will happen when I apply 0 0? When I apply 0, 0, note this is connected, this is connected, this is disconnected and this is disconnected. So, what will be out? Note since both are connected, this point 1 will be equal to this point because all these are connected. Well, since these are disconnected, these are gone off. So, your out will take a value 1. So, when I apply 0, 0, my output is taking a value 1. Now, let us take another combination which is 0, 1. When I apply 0, 1, note that this is disconnected while this is connected. Now, since both of them are in series, since this is disconnected, though this is connected, still this 0 will not reach here because this is disconnected. But so, since since both of them are in parallel, though this is disconnected, the 1 will still reach this out. So, when I apply 0 and 1, this 1 reaches out to this, while this 0 or 1, this 0 cannot reach here because still this part is disconnected. So, the output when I measure is going to be 1. When I do 1 0, <coughs> this is disconnected, this is connected this is connected, this is disconnected. Note again 0 cannot reach out because this is disconnected while 1 can still reach out because this is connected. So, the output of this would be 1 again. Now, let us say 1 1. When I apply 1, 1, this is disconnected, this is also disconnected, 
while both of them are connected. So, the 0 will reach out. So, when I apply 0, 0, I am getting 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So, what is this gate? This gate is the NAND gate. So, we have realized one unary gate and another. So, I am giving you one, all of you have internet facility, I want before the next class, I want you to look at this website, go to Google, search for invisible gorilla and look at this website. There will be lot of uh, uh, videos on this invisible gorilla website. Just see through these videos, each video would be some 2 minutes or 3 minutes and you have some 10 of them. So, you can spend that half an hour, then you will understand what it means to observe. There is some very interesting things on how to observe, some guidelines you get from that on how to observe, right. And I want you to do similar things when you sit through these lectures. I want you to observe more than what you see on the board, right? And that skill will take you a long way in your career, okay? Now, let us do some interesting observations more than this functionality that we have seen on this board. One of the thing is, whenever I get a 1 here, whenever I get a 1, it is always because of the top part of the circuit. It is always because of a P transistor. Let me write out whenever out is 1, it is because of P transistor. Similarly, whenever out is 0, it is because of N transistor. Now, when you actually start understanding the, the properties of the P and N transistor is actually not part of this course, but for your awareness I am mentioning the same. P transistors are good carriers of 1. If you give a 1 as an input to the P transistor, it gives you a strong 1 in the output. If you give a 0 as an input to an N transistor in the source, at the sink you get a strong 0. The vice versa is not true. If I give a 1 as an input to an N transistor, I get only a weak 1, the signal strength dissipates or the signal strength gets reduced. If I give a 0 as an input to a P transistor in the source, I get a weak 0 in the sink. So, P transistors are good carriers of 1 and the N transistors are good carriers of 0, the vice versa is not true, the P transistors are weak carriers of 0 and the N transistors are weak carriers of 1. So, whenever I want a 1 in the output, I get it realized through a P transistor. Whenever I got want a 0 in the output, I get it realized through a N transistor and that 0 will be a strong 0 
and that one will also be a strong one. So, <coughs> this particular property is called fully restored logic. Fully restored logic means that I have some voltage for one. I, 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 I did mention it may be 1.7 volt or 5 volt or anything depending on whichever technology you are using. Whenever I get a 1 as an output of a gate, that full 1.7 volt would be realized. Whenever I get a 0, I get that minimum uh, range for that 0 and it will be a strong 1 and a strong 0 as I proceed and this concept is called fully restored logic and this is very important because what happens in the digital circuit is that when I apply a voltage at the input pin, this voltage goes through the entire chip, gets processed in and finally comes as an output. As it progresses through the chip, its voltage should not diminish it should not become weak. When a 1 starts going from the input to the output, it should not become weak. It should always, its strength should always keep, it should always be maintained. This fully restored logic essentially ensures that the strength of a signal that does not diminish as the signal goes through the chip. This is one very, very interesting observation that you can see from the realization. Both in the case of a NOT gate and in the case of the NAND gate that we have seen, please realize that it both of them satisfies the fully restored logic property and that property is very important because of the reason that I mentioned just before. The reason is that as the signal goes from the input to the output, its, volt, its strength should not diminish and that is basically ensured by this fully restored logic property. Now, <coughs> the another interesting in observation that you see is that whenever I get a 1, this entire lower part, so you can actually now view this gate, the NAND gate and the NOT gate that I discussed earlier into two parts. One part is the P part another part is the n part. The p part is always responsible for giving you a 1, the n part is always responsible for giving you the 0. One another interesting observation here is that whenever the p part is on, even one of the transistor is on, the n part is disconnected from, from its 0. The p part is fed by 1, the n part is fed by the 0, whenever the p part is connected to 1, the n part is disconnected from 0. Whenever the p part is disconnected from 1, the n part is connected to the 0. So, you rarely find or you never find a scenario at stable conditions, right? You never find a scenario where both the p part is connected to 1 and the n part is connected to 0. This means you never find a short between the, the 1 and the 0. Typically, 0 is the ground and 1 is the uh, uh, source supply voltage. You never find a short between 1 and 0. If you have a short between 1 and 0, that is where large amount of power gets consumed. Since this implementation ensures that there is no short between 1 to 0, then this is also the secret why these, this gates realized using this technology consumes less power. So, to conclude what we have done today, we have understood the functionality of transistors, basically the P transistor and N transistor. And through this functionality, we did realize that the transistors have the ability to distinguish between a 0 and a 1 and that 
ability has been further exploited to realize two logical gates, one an unary gate called NOT, another a binary gate called NAND. And we also made two important observations about this NAND and the NOT gate implementations. One observation is that the one output is given by the P transistor, the zero output is always given by the N transistors. And this basically ensures that the ones and the zeros that you get as outputs of these trans uh, of these gates are going to be strong zeros and strong ones. This property is called fully restored logic and this property is very important for the correct working of the chip. And we also realized that whenever there is a zero or a one, the zero or one that is it ensures that there is no direct path from the source to the sink. And this basically ensures that these transistors in stable state consume less power and that is also the secret why computers can work with very low power supply. We will meet again on Friday 8 a.m. We have 5 more minutes and I just keep this 5 minutes for you to ask some questions. We will try and answer as many questions as possible and there will be also a chat window. A chat window is captured by the QEEE team and if there are more doubts there, they will communicate to me and I will try and answer them back. Now, the next 5 minutes I want, if you have a doubt please raise your hand and I will come in the interaction mode and try and answer as many queries as possible. Yes, JSC. Please ask your question. Ah, fully restored logic. What is it? What is it? Your question. Ah, that is what I have been explaining. I will explain you again the question for the other viewers. What is fully restored logic? Fully restored logic is that I need to get a strong one. My, so, if my one is 1.7 volt at the output, I should always realize 0.7 volt. I should not realize something like 1.5 volt or 1.3 volt. Now, by this since the P transistors are strong carriers of 1, if you even give a weak 1 in their source, they give you a strong 1 in their output. So, always since and the out is always realized, if a 1 output is always realized using a P transistor, even when you give a slightly lower voltage as the source, at the sink you will get that real 1.7 volt. So, as your signal progresses from the input to the output, at, the, at every output, if I get a 0, I am going to get a strong 0. If I am going to a 1, I am going to get a strong 1. In, in, another, uh, uh, in other, other words, this 1, the value of 1, the voltage value of 1 does not diminish because it is passing through a gate. Rather, when it passes through a gate, it, it gets back to this 1.7 volt value and that is what we mean by fully restoring the voltage value of a logical 0 or a logical 1 at every stage of your computation. Is it clear? Sir, what is the strong 0, strong 1 and weak 0 and weak 1? Ah, strong 0 is something close to the actual value. So, I fix 1 as say 1.7 volt. If I am going to get always very close to 1.7 volt, then it is called a strong 1. If I am going to get something like 1.5 or 1.4 volt, it is called a weak 1. 
Similarly, on the ground side, if I am going to get close to that 0.4 volts, it is going to be strong 0, but if I am going to get slightly more than that, then it is called a weak 0. Is it okay? Say yes or no? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes, B T K A T. So the my question is, uh, yes. sir, if you do mega and end it, end it, end it. So you want just you want to re end it, end. Yes. End it. So sir, uh, we have to. You just want an end gate. Yes, sir. You want to realize an end gate. That is part of the tutorial. You please solve it. I am giving it as an exercise to you as in the tutorial. Yes, there is a small trick there. Let me see whether you use the concepts I teach here. Any other question? Ah, thanks. Yes? This is V cap, V E C A P. Yes, please ask your question. So, can we design uh, all types of gates using these uh, transistors? Like uh, under gate, yes. over gate. You can design all the. Uh, you can design. You can design any Boolean circuit using this concept. But in the tutorial, we are going to teach you. Uh, or tutorial, you are. How do you design a NOR gate, a NA, yeah, OR gate, AND gate, etc. using this, right? So can we give you, a ternary inputs to these transistors, three inputs? We can do ternary gates, yes, we can realize any Boolean function using these concepts. Any Boolean function can right. be designed, right? So, though this is not part of the subject matter of computer organization, I uh, <coughs> Uh, I suggest a book by Veste. You just look at the first chapter of Veste, Estragian. First chapter of Veste, Estragian. <coughs> digital CMOS, just search for Veste, Estragian. It is digital CMOS design. I, I just forgot the. Uh, name of the book, but Veste Estragian, you search on Google, you will get the name of the book. Probably, most probably, there will be uh, a, a, a PDF version of the same, or you can go to any library, should have it. So, the first chapter actually tells you how to design any any Boolean circuit using the CMOS, uh, the, using this NMOS and PMOS. Fine? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I am just taking two more questions. Because we have another class here. VPCOE. Yes, please. Uh, good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Uh, sir, I just wa I want to ask about the threshold value in order to consider week 0 and week 1. The threshold value actually depends upon mm -hmm. the technology. So, <coughs> it uh, with, with uh, 1.7 volt the threshold value can be sometimes VCC by 3 could be the threshold that distinguishes between 0 and 1, right. And, uh, Today the technology is so that I can go and adjust the body bias to get different threshold voltages and these are techniques for realizing low power circuits also. So, the threshold, vol uh, threshold voltage in some sense is also programmable. Okay. So, in a tra given transistor, I can go and adjust the body bias to get realize different threshold voltages 
even after implementing them in the hardware. Okay, sir. Thank you. Last question. Please ask your question. Next. AIT, can you ask your question very quickly? Sir, can you carry speed transition to carry on 1? If you have 1, then we can change to 1. How can we have 1? I am not able to hear your question. Can you be slow and also talk into the mic? It is like as if you are talking from a well. Ah, yes, slowly, slowly. Yes, they should carry speed transition to carry on 1 and if we are carrying 1 8 into that it will be slow 1 then sir how can we apply 1 8 more because it will activate 0 oh, you please put it on the chat I am not able to follow please put on the chat I am not able to follow so others uh, questions please come on chat because we have another class and we are running out of time thank you we will meet on Friday morning 8 am sharp.